Ah. Well, the first drop always goes back to the earth. Thanks for our first harvest. Thank you to the honeybees and the plants that they know so intimately. And thanks for family and friendship and fecundity. Ah. Oh, that's good. So this is the mead horn. It has many, many epithets, does mead. The drink of immortality, the elixir of poetry, the mead of inspiration, the mead of wisdom, the mead of knowledge, the mead of everlasting life, the drink of the gods, the beverage of sovereigns. And it's true, it's very good for you. Possibly even the root of the word medicine is mead and honey with those mmm words as med and miod and mit and, and madu in Sanskrit. And traditionally the mead horn would, would circle around, but we can't do that now because of the, the COVID uh, pandemic. And, and the paradox and the irony is that the mead horn once was like the flu jab. Everybody would have a bit and drink from the same cup and get a piece of each other and keep our, our herd immunity and our community immune system strong. So good health to you all. And I'm here to relate to you a tale from Welsh mythology. Long ago, if all is true, that is not a lie. There lived a lord and his name was Tejid. Tejid Vol, and some say he was a good man, some say he was a bad man, but everybody says that he was wed to a woman of power, a woman of art and science and magic. And her name was Keridwen. Keridwen. And they had two children. The first was a beautiful girl. Her name was Kriawi and wherever she went, birds sang, rainbows appeared, flowers bloomed, bees swarmed. Everything she said was beautiful. Every word that mellifluously flowed from her lips was beautiful. And they also had one son and he was thick and ugly and stupid. And, and, and so hideous was he that they gave him awful nicknames. But Keridwen, she knew that she could not change his appearance, but she could instill him with power, with inspiration. She knew that she could fill his spirit and empower his life with the arts and science and magic and the blessings of the mighty ones. And she consulted the Ferecht, or the Book of the Ferecht, from the Mount of the Eagles, she went and there she learnt the recipe for awen. Awen, it's a, a word we still use today, A-W-E-N uh, in, in Welsh. And this story comes from a time, or tell, talks of a time, when a language similar to Welsh and Breton and Cornish was spoken all the way from, from Brittany all the way up to the Orkneys and everywhere in between. And awen is flowing spirit, the blessings of the mighty ones, that force that flows through us when our forehead is shining with light and we are inspired. And inspiration is one of the keys to a marvellous existence, which is what this mother wanted for her child. So she set her cauldron atop her fire and she soon learnt that the cauldron must simmer for one year and one day. And she employed two people to look after this cauldron while she was away collecting ingredients. A blind man, an old blind man. His job was to feed the fire beneath the cauldron with wood, but it must never boil and it must not spill a drop for when the elixir 
is to be drunk. Three drops would contain all of the knowledge, all of the power, all of the quintessence of this medicine and this magical brew. And three drops only would she feed to her son. Morvran, the sea raven, the cormorant or the great raven, they named him. And what is left would then be poison, bad knowledge, baleful knowledge. She employed a young boy and his name was Guion. Can you say Guion? Guion. Guion Bach. Little Guion. And his job was to sit by the cauldron and stir it. For one year and one day, he would sit here and stir Keridwen's cauldron. But it must never boil over, it must never spill a drop. For three drops would contain all of the goodness. And from time to time, Keridwen would return with, with a magical herb and place it into the cauldron. Everything has its own special time when it has its most potent hour, its most potent day and most potent moment of the year. And some say this is why the cauldron and the elixir takes one year and one day. Everything has a time when it cries and everything has a time when it laughs and everything has a time when it's most ripe to be harvested and placed into the cauldron. Mistletoe at the, the, the full moon or the, or the sixth day of the moon nearest to winter solstice or the summer solstice and, and many things all throughout the year at different times. Mugwort, henbane, apples, one piece of everything, like the Philosopher's Stone, went into this cauldron. All knowledge, omniscient poetic power. Well, a year and a day was nearly over. But the cauldron bubbled. A, a mischievous wind came in and whipped up the fire. And the cauldron bubbled and boiled and three hot scalding drops flew out of the cauldron and in midair landed on the thumb of little Gwion, stirring the cauldron. Ouch! Um! Bang! Suddenly those three drops travelled up through the palate of the roof of his mouth into his, into his brain and boom! Suddenly he knew everything that ever was and everything that possibly could be. Those three drops fizzed through his body and what was foremost on his mind. He knew that when Keridren returned, she would be furious. She would be fuming. And she would be full of will to kill him. So he, he just ran away as quickly as he could. And the cauldron, now containing baleful knowledge, poison, it cracked in half. And the poison uh, seeped into the land. And it went down to the, to the valley, to the stream where 150 horses were drinking and they died that day, the horses of Gwithno, Garanhir. Keridren returned. She saw the cracked cauldron. She saw Gwion had run. She saw uh, the blind man Mordred and she smote him and his eye fell out onto his cheek and he screamed, it was not me, it was Gwion. And she said, I know it was Gwion. And she ran off in the direction that he went and being a sorceress being a woman of magic she could change her shape and Gwion being full of the blessings of the potion being full of Awen and omniscient poetic knowledge he too could change his shape and he sensed her coming and he became the semblance of a hare with his twitchy nose and whiskers and keen eyes looking all around. And he saw her coming in and she changed herself into a hound. Quick, keen-nosed, long-sighted, long-legged, long dog. And she chased him and she ran at him, but he zigzagged across the fields and the hedges and over the rocks. And she chased him and chased him and as a hare, 
he thought he could evade her, but she pushed him to his limits. And just as she was about to scoop him up in her jaws, he jumped into the air. And in mid-air, he changed himself again. He shook off the skin of a hair and he grew the scales of a fish. And he landed in a, in a clean river. And with his knowledge of the undercurrents, he swam upstream, feeling the water, feeling the element, hiding in the, in the weeds. And she shook off the semblance of the greyhound bitch. And she grew the oily hair of an otter. Strong tailed, sharp clawed, spike teethed otter. And she dived into the water and quickly shut with the undercurrents. And, and he thought he knew the river. He used his fish's muscles and jumped and swam and dived. But not until she chased him did he really have to get to know that element and get to know himself and get to know the currents and the movement of the water and his limits. And she was relentless. And just as she was about to take his tail and eat him whole, or in three quick bites, <coughs> he jumped out of the water. And again in mid-air, he shook off the fish scales and the fish tail. And he grew the wings of a bird and the beak of a bird and the eyes of a bird and the senses of a bird. And just as she was about to take his fish tail and eat him in three quick gulps, he jumped out of the water and again in mid-air he shook off the skin of a fish and the tail of the fish. And he took on and grew feathers and the senses of a bird and the beak of a bird, the eyes of a bird. And he could almost see the currents of the air moving around him and he floated and, and flew moving his tail and flew away from the river. And Caradwen jumped out of the river, shaking off her otter skin and grew eagle feathers and eagle beak. And with her eagle eyes, she shot up and soared around higher and higher, pursuing him, diving here and turning on a sixpence. He would evade her, her, uh, her pred predation of him. But she was relentless. And she did not stop. And he really had to fly fast. And he really had to know the wind and the thermals and where he could dive, where he could hide and how he could turn. But she was on him. And as she blocked out the sun, one final swoop, he changed one final time into a single grain and he fell to earth and landed on the earth. And some say that Cariduan is really his initiatrix. And as he became a hare, that fiery nature, or earthy nature, she pushed him and was teaching him. And as he became a fish, she was pushing him and teaching him. You know, like a good teacher, will always push you further than you will push yourself. And as he knew the air, she pushed him. And when he became a grain of wheat, She landed, and he landed, in a farmyard, in a threshing yard, and he was surrounded by thousands of other grains of wheat. And he felt safe and he was still, a kernel full of power and potential. 
and the beginnings of all life as a seed. But she shook off her eagle feathers and she grew black feathers in their place. And she shook off her eagle beak and grew a hen's beak and a fiery red crest. And she began to scratch and pack, peck and peck and scratch and scratch and scratch and scratch and scratch and peck and peck and peck and peck and And she scratched through the whole of the farm until she found him. And she ate him. Nine nights, nine months, he stayed roasted in her oven. Nine long months. And then, if all is a lie, it is not truth. And if all is true, that is not a lie. And if all that is fair and free beneath star and stone, she gave birth to a baby boy, a child. And at that moment, the clouds parted and the sun shone upon this child. And it was against all of her teachings and traditions to kill a child of her own. And this was Guion reborn. But she did not name him. She just wrapped him in a leather bag. This is Guion's third incubation. First, in her homestead, stirring her cauldron. The second, in the oven, in her belly, roasted as a seed. And the third, in this leather bag, some say a coracle. For she put him, this bag, this leather container, into the river Conway. And let it go. And it floated off and his life now in the hands of the mighty ones, the spirit of that river, the gods. Well, this is not the end of this tale. For there was a lord who owned a weir in thus river. And every May Eve, on the eve of May Day, of the Mai Kalends, of, the, of Beltane, this fire festival of fertility. It is said if you were to fish in this weir, you would find a hundred salmon and you'd be rich for life. And the Lord Gwytho, remember him, his horses were poisoned by the baleful knowledge. He had a, a nephew called Elfin and he was always fighting and fornicating and getting into trouble, wasting and overusing his privileges as the nephew of a lord. And he knew that if he asked his uncle for the fishing rights, which he was very entitled to have, to fish in the weir this May Eve, that then his, his uncle would say no. So cleverly he waited for a feast, a public opportunity where he could stand in front of other guests and stand up and ask for the fishing rights in the weir. And sort of disgruntled, and, but quite impressed by the youth's um, candor and, and uh, cunning, he granted him the fishing rights. So he went to this special magical place at this sacred time, this magical time, when the veils are thin, time of potency and power to sit by the river, by the weir. But not one fish, not one salmon, not any kind of fish did he see in the water, not a ripple. Oh, just my luck, he thought. And as the morning rays of sun rose, he saw something in the reeds and the rushes. What's this, he thought. And he went over to it and it was the leather bag, the coracle, and he picked out from inside uh, and undid this leather bag. And out 
jumped the child, this newborn boy, and his forehead was shining like the sun, this magical child, Gwydion now twice born, twice born from the goddess, into full manifestation in the world. Fully alive, fully being, fully aware, full of poetry and song and story. And he uttered a prophecy and he uttered many words. He said, I've been a stick, a spade, a roebuck on the mountainside. I have been an axe. I have been roasted in the Keridran's oven for nine nights. I know why silver shines. I know why liver is bloody. I know how many spears make a confrontation. I know how many drops of rain make a shower. I know the transits of Venus. I know all the stars from east to west. I know everything that has been and everything that ever could be and will be. And, and Elfin uh, took the child, put him on his horse and rode back to his uncle, Gwithno, and said, Uncle, I did not fish any salmon last night, but I found this child and he's told me many wondrous things. And I'd like to bring this child up to be my own. I'd like to foster this child and give him opportunity and life and, and, and a platform to sing and tell his poetry and prophesize. And Gwithno looked at him he said, oh, Taliesin, he said, when he first saw the child's shining forehead, it was radiant with light, shining with light, like the sun pouring out of his forehead. And thus the child had a name. And this bard, Taliesin, became one of the finest masterful bards of the whole of the Isles of Britain. And that is the story of the birth of Taliesin. That has come from the Welsh tradition, the Brythonic tradition of the Isles of Britain. And the cauldron of Ceridwen, the three drops of Awen, and the blessings of the, the poetry of inspiration, and the drinks and the meads of inspiration, and these sacred brews, entheogenic, inspiring, health-giving, prophesizing brews of the Isles of Britain. Bendithiachi. Bendithiuchi. And here in the in the contemporary current emanation of the Druidic traditions, we have this symbol here, which is the Awen itself. We call it the Awen. Three rays of light coming from, from these three dots. It's evolved over time. So 200 years ago you lived in one dot here. And the This symbol has evolved over time. In this form, it, it's as the, uh, the symbol of the order of bards, obates and druids. With the three circles of existence and the three drops of Keridron's cauldron. And these three rays of light. And in our order, we, the, the lessons are called Gwersi. And that word means lesson, still does today in Welsh. And it relates to the, to the gueres, or the rays of sunlight. And they also, is it, encoded in a symbol of so many things, the, the sun rises at the solstices and the equinox, and truth, honour and justice, and, and I and O and A and the vowels, and the bardic force and the awen that flows through us. So here's an honour of the ancient traditional honey, medicinal, creative strategies of the ancient mead-amused bards of the Isles of Britain and their mellifluous words. And Taliesin indeed composed a, a song called the Kanu Imed, a song of mead. And I'd love to share this mead with you. Uh, 
it's <laughs> how can I describe it? I need to go on one of those courses to describe drinks. But it's a mm, of course it's sweet, but it's tempered with some some pollen and some herbs and some apple and pear in here as well. So it's balanced the, the crispness and the sourness of the apple with the sweetness of the honey. Mm. There are three medicines in the world. Water, honey and labour. Well, the three medicines of the Medhagoth, Medhagon Muthfai. Water, honey and labour. And if you put those three things together, uh, we have mead or methaglin when it has herbs in. So another story. The theme of your, uh, your festival this year, this festival of the Heart and Mind Festival is, is, has an animistic theme of animals and totems. Hence the request for this, this story of the, of the shape-shifting Taliesin and the shape-shifting Keridwen. And how when we inhabit these, these qualities and when we, when we work with these brothers and sisters and animals, and cousins. We have many different teachings. So here's another story, another animal story. And it's a story of the first flute. And that this is not elder, this is made of boxwood. But many of the first flutes were made from bone. All the way up at the house, There's a, we have some bone flutes here. They're some of the oldest flutes in the world, I think, were made of swan bones. And of course, human bones. And an instrument that's played with the breath just has spirit and ether flowing through it. And I've heard this story from various places. It's kind of universal. There was a time when flutes did not exist. A time when states did not exist, but just tribes. People in harmony with nature. Living and moving around the landscape perhaps a winter quarter and a summer quarter, following deer, following herds, following fish, following seasons. And amongst those people were trackers and stalkers and scouts and, and uh, hunters, walking barefoot, who knew all the sounds of the woods, all the sounds of the forest, all the sounds of the jungle, all the sounds and sights of the desert, wherever they were upon the planet. And this is before writing, before the written word, before books, before the magic of books, we read the magic of nature, the tracks in the ground, the smell of the wind and the weather-wise noses and skin and foreheads and bones and the palpable knowing of weather and movement and air and water and humidity and season and the stars above. And one of the tribe, he felt a strong urge to leave, to go, to head off. And he made all in all the right customs according to their people. He made the right offerings in the village and to their ancestral tree where the bones of their, of their beloved dead were hung. 
and he took his tools, his bow and his songs and his courage and he stepped out of the domain of the safety of the village and he set off and he walked and he walked and he walked for an immeasurable amount of time. Though he kept a keen watch on the stations of the sun and the mansions of the moon and the turning of the stars that gave him time. But he moved into a timeless place also, where everything happens when it's right to happen. And he went beyond all the stories of his people. He went beyond all the histories of his people into places unknown, unsung, untold, across seas and lakes, mountains and great places where nothing grew. Until one day he learnt many things until one day he, he sat beneath a great tree that he considered was at the middle of the world, at this crossroads between everything. He sat there and he heard a noise like he'd never heard before. He couldn't place it. Was it a bird? What was it? And and this song uh, relaxed him. It relaxed his shoulders, it relaxed his elbows and his wrists, it relaxed his heart and his mind. And he sat with his back against that tree. And this song took him inwards and his eyelids fell. And any frowning or furrow fell away from his forehead. And he sat leaning against that tree for three days and three nights. And when he awoke, the song had gone. Oh, I want to know where that song comes from. I want to bring that song back to my people. I feel reborn, I feel cleansed. I feel better than I've ever felt. And I want to share this feeling and, and bring this feeling and this, this healing to my people. And then he heard it again, this, this noise. up and he saw it at the end of the longest branch. Some branches had died and the wood had seasoned and there were holes in the wood and then when the wind picked up he heard it again. going to climb this tree and I'm going to take that branch and when he had that thought the wind grew stronger and picked up dust and blew it into his eyes out ah! Ah. and he knew that was a bad thought and he felt shame and he sat and he kindled a fire 
and he sat by the fire, waiting for another message, what to do next. And he kept feeding the fire, listening. He was back on the tree, feeling strong again. And as the wind rose, he'd hear the sounds, relaxing his shoulders and his elbows and his wrists, his heart and his mind. Waiting for, for something, someone. And he'd feed the fire. He sat there again for another three days and three nights. Watching the stars in the evening, and the sunrise in the morning, waiting. And then, then it came. And then came, in came a woodpecker. And it circled the fire three times. And looked at him and just sat there and watched and listened. And the woodpecker showed him that that was his flute and how he'd made those holes. He said, you can't take my flute. That's stealing, I made that flute. You must make your own. <laughs> and as the bees circled the trees, the woodpecker flew off. So he climbed the tree and he measured with his hair and his thumb and his arm. And he came back down and he drilled with some stone and some wood. He drilled holes in his flute, in his new flute. And he sat there and he learned to play. And then he took it home. And that is the story of the first flute. And he brought that music and that healing and that soothing back to his people. And he taught other people how to play and how to make them. And they taught other people who taught someone else, who taught someone else, who taught someone else, who taught, someone else, who taught Tony. He made this one. <laughs> and uh, today flute makers are still turning, drilling holes, polishing and tuning and of course we are still playing. And now I've told you this story, you can tell it to somebody else. The first flute. <laughs> Thank you.
So every creature has something to teach us, if we listen. Well, thank you. It's been an enjoyable, enjoyable afternoon. <laughs>